More than 2,500 children were forcibly adopted in the UK last year by social services. It's a controversial practice that's facing widespread criticism at home and abroad. Daniel Hawkins met one family who've experienced the ordeal. A room made for a little princess, but these toys will remain unused and the baby cot has never been slept in. Jane Harley's granddaughter has never even been home. After being born, the child was removed straight from hospital by the police and social services to prevent what they claimed was a risk of future emotional harm because of the father's criminal record. I went into the room, there were police there, two police officers and social services and my daughter was crying and begging me to help her and I said, what's happening? What's, what's going on? The police told me to shut up and every time I said, why are you doing this? What's happening? You know, I was told to shut up. Uh, social services said that they were taking the baby. Jane and Neil applied to be guardians of the baby, offering to meet any conditions set out by the authorities and undergoing numerous assessments. But after a lengthy legal battle, the child was put up for permanent adoption. We would give our lives for our granddaughter. She loves us. She calls him dad, dad, me, nan, nan. You know, at the end of contact visits, when we had to say goodbye, she would literally hang on to me here. Nan, 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 nan. She'd go all red in the face and they'd have to literally prise her off. One time it took three attempts to force her into the car seat. She was hysterical, screaming my name. Can you imagine what that's like? And I just have to stand there and let her go. Jane and Neil's story is part of a wider pattern. The last five years have seen a growing trend of forced removal and adoption through secret courts. The latest period saw nearly two and a half thousand forced adoptions. That's the equivalent of more than 250 classrooms of children. The UK is one of only two EU countries to use such heavy-handed policies, forcibly taking children from families before any allegations have been made, with evidence only from a small team of experts. Parents are often prevented from speaking out under threat of prison. Those closest to the system insist it is working. Uh, we do put children first, whatever, whoever their parents are. Our legislation is very clearly based upon the welfare of the child principle and sometimes that does get us into conflict with parents, and, uh, it, but it, that's our legislation. There's no doubt that social services do crucial work keeping many children safe from abuse. But the practice of forcibly taking children from their families who've never committed a crime and never harmed a child is becoming increasingly controversial both with British and European families as well as experts. I don't think many people, certainly I don't, take the view that we should be uh, trying to take children away from parents if there's the good prospect uh, and a reasonable prospect that the parents or parents with um, help from their families, uh, young parents with help from their parents as well, the grandparents, are going to be able to bring up the child. And for a child to have the identity of still being with their natural family is generally seen as very important for a child. Uh, and for parents who've had children to be able to bring those children up is important for the parents. Numbers of forced adoptions have fallen in recent months, but this is a drop in the ocean with the trend of recent years. Faced with strong criticism, the government may have to take a long look at its adoption policies, but this will be a small consolation to families like the Harleys, who have already lost their children. Daniel Hawkins, RT, London. Hello there, so would uh, you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Katie Jane Swallow. I, I'm one of the admin from Families Destroyed by the State. We cover a lot of forced adoption and other topics surrounding children and to better the children's future. So would you like to give some background in what's happened to you in your life? Uh, I actually lost my son twice. I lost my son the first time to long-term long foster care and managed to get him back because the doctor put in a report uh, which covered a witness statement which proved it was nothing to do with me. Uh, the then social services then found out I was pregnant with my daughter and the week before he was born, the day before they were supposed to sign us off, they got well, they organised with my son's dad kidnapping him so that they could take my daughter. They, well, they put actually... my daughter up for adoption on the 8th of March so I've not seen either of my kids for over a year now. They, they, they forced your, uh, the, the baby's dad to adopt, um, kidnap him? Yeah, just my eldest. That's outrageous. 
And uh, how have you been coping with that situation? Fighting every day. I have to convince myself that families are strived by the state. The page is my kids, as it's built off what happened to my kids. So I try to spend as much time on there and helping people as much as possible. It's the only time I get with them. So did you manage to go to court over this situation? Uh, yeah, I, I was I did go through court. I was, went through two and a half years worth of court. Um, towards the end, I did end up representing myself because I figured out what they were doing and how the, sol the solicitors uh, work with the family court and sold the social services and calf gas guardians are actually ex-social workers. Majority can, of them are off. can you elaborate what you mean by they, they all work together? How do you know this? They all work from the same system. I mean, when you come to first interact with social services, you get given a list of solicitors you're allowed to use. And obviously, if you can't afford to privately get a solicitor outside of the area you live in, it makes it near enough impossible. The only way of representing yourself in a family court is by representing yourself. It's the, is the only way of getting your voice heard. And the judge does have to tell you. But I didn't know any of this when I was going through it. I didn't realise the family justice system was so unjust and corrupt. What do you, what do you think... They achieve out of doing this, though? I know they achieve the money from it, the bonuses and the expenses. If you look into how much it costs to adopt, you'll see there. And also, if you have a look at the costs of the court costs for the families going through court for the removal of the children, that all goes back into the system, which is where they all get funded from. So they protect the system because they have to protect their livelihood. Oh, uh, I'm sorry to hear. So, is there no way of ever getting contact with your kids ever again? I can fight to get contact with my son, which is highly unlikely due to how violent this father is and the circumstances social put me in with him. But with my daughter, no, there's absolutely nothing I can do that I know of anyway. But they will be able to try and contact you if they want to when they're older, I presume. Yes. Um, but if you have a look at how long it takes adoptees to look for their parents, it's touching on 30, 40 years. And it, it does all depend on that parent assessment, the first parent assessment that's done, because that's what the child will be given to make the decision upon if the parent, if they want to see their parent or not. And you get set up beyond belief in the parent assessments. You'll read it afterwards and be absolutely insistent that they've given you someone else's assessment when in actual fact it's yours your name's just been copied and pasted onto someone else's well a, a lot of people may be watching and thinking that uh well you could have been a bad brother i mean what, what do you say to these people that will talk, say these things to you look at my kids look at the videos and the pictures of my kids they'll tell you themselves exactly what they were like with me exactly what i was like as a mum my son's got four photo albums, my daughter's got five, and I've got four, all full to the brim, all photos of them from their entire lives, the entire time with me, and every single time I've seen my kids, they've always had a massive smile on their face. They've, I don't even shout in my house, because the world's dark enough as it is without introducing children to that. I grew up with my mum and dad arguing, I wasn't going to do that to my kids. So, so what is your role now? What do, what, you've got this, uh, this families destroyed by the state. What, what do you do with this um, group? Uh, we're there to support families and parents who are going through the system, direct them to people who can help them better than us are in certain situations that we can't. Uh, we help get children's and families' voices heard through what's happened to them. Uh, we, we do work 24-7 on this as well because we do get parents during the night as well that are struggling to cope. We've had uh, suicide letters being sent in and caught, you know, quite a lot of people are struggling so we try and do our best. Show people that you can go out by yourself, you can go out with a couple of people, reach out and someone will listen. Try and encourage and teach as much as we can. Educate and encourage people to research because the evidence is all there. We came across it when we first started looking into it when it first happened to us. Yeah. It's 
obviously it's not just force adoption admin that we've got on there we have got a lot of admin from a lot of different groups well um i really wish you all the best in everything you're doing and uh i hope you can save a few families along the way I've spent a long time picturing you, babies, and the color of your eyes. Will you be taller, a redhead like your grandma, with a smile like mine? What is a cow day? What is a cow day? I don't know. Come on, what cow does? Everybody's going. Yeah. Hey. What does a sheep do? No. No. What does a sheep do? Yeah. What does a pig do? Yeah. <laughs> what does a dog do? Yeah. yeah. What does a snake do? Yeah. What does a snake do? My heart. Yeah. What does a lion do? What does a lion do? What does a lion do? That's why I'm Stop looking at yourself in the camera, what does a lion do? Show them what a lion does. Mama? What does a lion do? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> what does a uh, rabbit do? <laughs> no, what does a rabbit do? But the truth rabbit do? <laughs> Wait, it's driving it's me Wait, what does a birdie do? What's a bird do? What I want to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait. My love Look at this. It's deeper than the ocean. Good ever. Why I'm letting go I always felt with you With someone else's boys I'm only bringing you here And I feel blessed To bring you to
On a gloomy February morning, two English women flee their country to seek refuge in France. Jane is accompanying her daughter Bethany, who is eight months pregnant. The authorities have threatened to take her first child away from her at birth. I had to leave England. Well, social services were going to take my baby, so this was the only choice I had to be a mother. They give you no explanation. They just come in and say, we're taking your baby because we've got issues of um, possible abuse in the future. In the UK, the law allows future parents to be suspected of future abuse. People can be accused of being bad parents before they even become parents. Suspicion falls is on poorer parents. These interventions which make sure that children are removed before harm is caused. What's actually happening is that the poor are being blamed for their own poverty. Colin and Claire should have taken this threat of social sanction more seriously. Social services took their first child away from them at the maternity clinic. We was told that we will lose our daughter as soon as she comes along. They see Claire as an easy target. Me, they're sort of using my past against me. Colin and Claire's baby was adopted soon afterwards. She will never be returned to them. Mark and Nikki also lost their children. Accused of beating them, they were later cleared. Their youngest child's repeated bone fractures were actually caused by a disease. We knew he was ill. We'd brought him to hospital. Nikki just mentioned that we do have brittle bones in the family. And they immediately dismissed it. They destroy families for no reason. They just want to achieve the senseless targets that the government has set them. From 2010, all children's services authorities were told to increase adoption numbers wherever possible, do whatever they can. And there clearly are cases where social workers have fabricated evidence in order to get children adopted. In England, one in three families have been suspected by social services at least once before. People in other countries don't believe that this is happening in England. Hi everybody, with Katie Jane from Families Destroyed by the State. Today we're joined with my good friend Thomas. Uh, Thomas, would you like to introduce yourself and explain a bit about what you do? Yeah, of course. Um, my name is uh, Thomas. And basically, I got involved because I've got a law degree. And I was just looking to help people, you know, on social media. And I came across, you know, several family court groups. And that's how I got involved. And I began to do independent research. I began to understand the threshold law, which is what you need for forced adoption. And basically, it went from there. So um, obviously, you deal with the legal side of it, the lawful side of it. Um... What have you found about forced adoption, uh, how recent it is, how current it is, like what people don't see about it? Can I just say one word? Absolutely shocking. Just shocking. That's the only word I can literally muster. Because of someone with a legal background and I'm looking at what goes on, you know, you have like interim care orders whilst the mother is actually in hospital. And I'm thinking, what country are we in? You know, it's absolutely diabolical, a diabolical state of affairs. And you have these um, transparency uh, project, and these are supposed to be like the legal professionals who are trying to get transparency in the family court, which of course is great, but they're looking at it from a professional angle and they're looking at, you know, forced adoption. Oh, that's just like a bad apple or a rare case. On the contrary, it's absolutely a phenomenon that's going on near enough every single day that I'm aware of. What are some of the worst cases that you've heard of of how they've actually managed to remove the children? Obviously not names, we're not asking names. No, no, of course not. Um, well, what I was saying before about the law of the threshold, this threshold is a sort of like ad hoc. It's like if you don't quite have it today, you can go back to court for another go. You know, it, it's, it's so manic. You're talking about missing appointments, you know, a few dirty dishes in the sink, a few toys which are spread out. That is essentially the, the threshold that I'm coming across. Or more predominantly, it's more young people, in particular, young women who are victims of domestic abuse. I would say that is largely what I'm coming up against. And they're not even getting any help. But when, he, when they do, 
actually somehow, and I don't know how they do it, but they do, they force themselves out of that relationship. Then the local authority, they sort of twist them as being the victim. And it was your fault, you know, if you wouldn't have been in that relationship, you know, we wouldn't have had to remove the child. So then they call it future emotional harm. It is just absolutely shocking. It really, really, I mean, I constantly stress to people how easy it is to remove children, but obviously with a legal background, what's your take on how they can get children away? I mean, you hear it all the time that it's really difficult to remove children, but it's not from my experience. What's your take? You know, I didn't actually know how easy it was. A social worker essentially types stuff on a template and then it's in court before you know it. You're not talking about a lawyer. You're not talking about a barrister or a solicitor who's going to these family courts. You're talking about a social worker. And I was trying to explain to a social worker because a parent actually, you know, obviously no names mentioned, but a parent actually called me. I was live in a hospital speaking to senior nurses and senior social workers and junior social workers and I'm trying to explain to them the law of the threshold and human rights and they're going what are you talking about you know all I'm doing is just moving the child because of significant harm I said but you know what significant harm is yeah have you heard of the children act I said well I do hope so because I do have a law degree (laughs) but it's absolutely shocking it shocks me to the core and for any lawyer to turn around and go oh no the parents are bad it's not at all because you know what i look at the statistics and the the stats are every year six hundred thousand are referred to social services out of that four hundred thousand going to children in need out of that fifty six thousand are on a child protection plan i mean it's absolutely diabolical so to answer your question when I look at from the law, it's like I'm living in Iraq, you know, ISIL, ISIS. I, I, I cannot compute. In psychology, we use a term, cognitive dissonance. Well, social services in the UK have come under fire for forcibly taking children from their parents for seemingly minor reasons. Care workers insist they are always putting the best interests of the children first, but families say they're needlessly broken up and critics claim the system is all wrong. RT's Laura Emmett investigates. A woman jailed for waving to her children across the street. A mother in court over sending her eight-year-old son a birthday card. They may sound like surreal sound bites from a totalitarian state, but actually they're headlines from the UK. Christopher Booker is an investigative journalist who's looked into what he calls forced adoption. I had a case the other day where a mother was about to deliver her child in a, in a hospital and five policemen and two social workers came into the delivery room to seize that child. Five policemen with a, with, with a mother who is helpless lying there giving birth to her baby. I mean, it is, you can't believe such things are happening. This family is now a happy one, but it was once torn apart and anger remains at the actions of social services. Little Constancia's elder sister was taken into state care aged just four months and social workers wanted to take Constancia too at birth. I did think my, my daughter come back to us after, after a time, but um, she ended up being put up for adoption uh, about uh, three years ago. My daughter was about to come back to us when um, a psychologist came forward and diagnosed us uh, as paranoid, depressed, and he used a, a term remote. And on that basis of that, it, it was harder to get my daughter back. Although that diagnosis was refuted by other doctors, it took John Fowler five years to get his daughter back. She was taken on evidence from his 11-year-old stepson, who accused John and his wife of hitting their children, something they deny. I wouldn't say I was a brilliant stepfather. There was um, there was uh, problems in the house, but I didn't think it merited taking my daughter into care, you know, and, and take, putting them into care themselves. Um, I think the problems could have been addressed uh, in, in a better way. There are around 60,000 children in care in the UK, half a percent of the total child population. Christopher Booker says there are hundreds, possibly thousands of cases a year in which children are wrongly taken, and he's suspicious about the motives. There is a very considerable amount of money to be made for, for, uh, if you're an adoptive parent, 
you take in one of these children or you're a foster carer, you can get 400 pounds a week for each child, which is, a, if you have two or three adopted children, it's a hell of a lot of money. So the whole thing has become a very nasty, inhuman racket. At the other end of the spectrum, there are shocking stories of abuse and neglect, such as the infamous Baby P scandal. In that case, social workers failed to remove a toddler from his parents, who ultimately tortured him to death. Social workers say it's a fine balance and that the goal is to keep families together wherever possible. It's, it's going to be a debate that goes on and on and on. Either we're, you know, we're, we're too accommodating of parents who have um, obviously difficulties in caring for their children or we're overzealous and we're, we're just taking these children um, and you know, really swiftly and promptly and just placing them for adoption and, and, and those are two extremes. It's a process that's shrouded in secrecy by the law, and social services refuse to discuss individual cases. But they do say that once a child is in care, the priority is to have them adopted as soon as possible. That emphasis led to John Fowler's daughter being advertised in a local newspaper like these, a practice that's become commonplace. John Fowler's story has a happy ending. He got his elder daughter back, although she's still under surveillance by the social services, and fought to keep baby Constancia. For some children, being adopted represents a chance for a better life. But there are other families who claim they're torn apart by the social services without good reason, and they say it's a life-changing injustice. Laura Emmett, RT, London. The social services should be there to protect our children. And they're not, they're there to scare us into doing what they want us to do. So basically, if they don't find these kids for adoption, if they don't find an excuse, whatever that excuse may be, whether how minor it is or major, they, is, they will lose money. Yeah. So in effect, children are being adopted because of the monetary um, yes. incentives. Yes. I don't particularly like people. <laughs> I don't. And uh, it makes it very difficult to be a social worker. <laughs> Which is the reason I don't like people, so it's circular. If you don't meet your target, you're also docked across the board in your entire grant. So the incentive to find kids for adoption is overwhelming. In theory, a child should only be in foster care if it's necessary, not for just stupid reasons. Well, what would be stupid reasons? Well, in my to... view, if you've got a situation where mum's been beaten up by dad and they've split up and mum's got the kids, you shouldn't take the kids off mum. Well, why do they then? Well, you have to ask them. <laughs> it's called... Well, you're an MP, you well, make no. the laws, well, yeah, sort but of. The point is the courts don't necessarily follow the laws because they're in secret. They, they don't necessarily follow the laws properly and all sorts of procedural things go wrong. Don't worry about it, we'll stand here all night. Well, you can stand here all night then, sweetheart. It's, it's too cold for you to be doing that. And to be honest, you're supposed to be out catching criminals. Now, I've done nothing wrong. I'm not calling you a criminal. No, 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 but that's what your job is. Your job is to go catch criminals, people that actually break the law. After dealing with these two police officers, all of a sudden another another four turned up. All right, we're here to do a welfare check on your child. Right. So if you facilitate that, I'm sure we can assist you. I requested that only two officers enter my home. I, think, I, think I will let it. two officers right. into my house. Well, two. Okay. Well, I'm a sergeant, so you and I'll come in. We'll have a chat to you. All right, and we'll take it from there. And they asked me very nicely, could you just make sure the dog's not in the way, you know? I don't know your dog, you know your dog. Would you be able to get your dog under control in a different room, with, away from the baby, so we could just go in and do the welfare check without having to worry about dogs? It could be very, very straightforward. So I don't think it has to be as complicated as it's true. I know, I know. You don't need a dog shield at all. So yeah, it's no, not no, aggressive no. whatsoever. Um, just to tell you guys, you have been recorded. I know we are aware of that, thank you. Okay, <laughs> even on the computer. No worries, that's fine. Thank we you. expect you to honour your oath today. We're coming to checking the welfare of a small child. It's nothing okay. to do with criminal investigation at this stage. Okay. We're coming in to basically check the welfare of a child. And we have uh, how to do that to save life and limb. Save life and limb, he's right. That's common law, yeah. Yeah, that's common law. Yeah. So we can enter on that. Okay, yeah, then we grant you permission to come and view the child. Simple as that.
You've got one child removed every 20 minutes in the UK, 24-7, 365 days a year, right? Right now. So during this, during this today, how many kids have been removed? Not, and it has to be immediate risk of harm, remember that, for any removal, right? And it's obviously not the majority of the time. We're all proof for that. And the superior officer has come into my home after, again, clarifying that there was a welfare check that... Um, that he, and that he was under his oath, that all of a sudden, due to my concealment of pregnancy, that they were forcibly taking my son from my care. Concealed pregnancy? I haven't concealed a pregnancy all right, okay. at well, all. We're going to take the child. Why are we on that? Whoa, 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 whoa. No. Yes, yes. No. 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 I am, I am a breastfeeding mother. That's fine. Spence? No. No. Just come in. No. Yeah, no. no. Under what law? And then the rest barged in. What court order? I want a no. court order right now in this house, signed by a judge. There's and nothing wrong with him. Right, can you I just go to the barrier? Sal, I mean, she's going. I want to get ink signature. Come outside. Come outside. I've been peaceful. Come outside. I've been peaceful. No, you have. They've assaulted my partner. They've assaulted me. And we caught it all on film. Just come outside. Right, why, 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 you why, 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 why are you why are you taking why why are you taking my son? Why are you taking my son? He was never read his rights, so he wasn't arrested. Why? Our child has been stolen! Right, can you Our watch? child has been stolen! Right. Our child has been stolen! Our child has been stolen! Now you need to speak to John Emming because he's got the bloody statistics. We know, for instance, last year that about 11,000 children were compulsorily taken into care. That compares to the figures in 1995 of 5,500. You have to ask yourself, are the children any safer now that 11,000 are taken into care each year rather than 5,500? I think the answer is no, which gives you evidence to the fact that um, the care system's taking the wrong children into care. Why do you think they're, they're taking children away from perfectly good families and putting them into foster care with people that could possibly abuse them themselves? It's money. It all boils down to money in the end. They get thousands of pounds per child just on the day they remove them. And the longer they can keep that child in care, the more money they get in their back pocket and they get their points for their little catalogue. Up till two years ago, there were millions of pounds which I listed on my website given to the councils for fulfilling their adoption targets. There was such a fuss about this, adopting people just to get the money, <coughs> that the targets were abolished officially, the money target, but the targets still exist. The instruction from Tony Blair, the Prime Minister at the time, to increase adoptions by 40% in so much time, that still exists and they still go <coughs> for adoptions. The one down on Bread Street at the moment. And then you go over here, it says Social Company. Social Services. Let's go. And there we have it. All these are oh, trading for profit companies. It's 20. Is it any wonder they want to take our kids into care? You know how many of these social services are there? Yeah, pretty interesting, huh? So, would you like to introduce yourself and explain a bit about what's happened to you and what's brought you here? Well, hi everyone. Uh, as Katie's just said, I'm Savannah. Um, I, I I try and have a big role in families destroyed by the state and help people, given the situation I've just been in myself. Um, Oh, I don't even know how to explain it. Yeah, it, it started by um, Lorna's been arrested for a crime that he didn't commit. Um, 
and about a week after he was arrested we'd gone to my 38 week appointment with the midwife and after my appointment with the midwife i had two social workers and an outreach midwife and bushels at the midwife appointment um, they took me into a separate room, took Lorne and his mum out. I asked Lorne's mum to come to all my appointments with me because I had two previous miscarriages, so I were dead anxious all the way through my pregnancy with Demi. So she was there for support. So they took me into one room and Lorne and his mum into a complete separate room. Um, they started saying that Lorne was a danger to be around and... Um, that you know, if I stayed with him, did want to take Demi off me. Um, what else did they say? What What did they say to you in that meeting? Oh, it was a big <laughs> that yeah, they, they were saying he was that much of a danger that he couldn't go to the birth of our daughter. Um, so the first thing we said was, right, well, we're going seeking legal advice about this. Um, we left the appointment, went to a solicitor's, and. All that a solicitor could really tell us was, baby's not here yet, proceedings haven't started, so we can't give you too much advice. Um, but the one thing we can tell you is, they cannot physically stop him from going to the birth. The only two people that can is me and the hospital. Now, about three days after I had that initial meeting, I was called in to have another meeting at the social workers' like base thing. Um, at that meeting they took me away from lawn and moved me they said if i didn't do the move then again because they, they already told me they were going to court as soon as demi was born anyway um they said if i didn't comply with them and do as they're asking now they were going to go for a removal rather than a cur order um so i got bullied into doing it you know i was on my own i was scared as it is um, I got forced away from Lorne, all my support around me. Oh, sorry, there was two seconds. That was my fault. Apologies. Um, I, yeah, we're taken away from him. Um, and then a couple of days after that, I was told I needed to sign a working agreement. Now, in the working agreement, it stated that I weren't allowed any indirect or direct contact with Lorne or his mum. Um, the only time I could contact them was to let them know that I've gone into labour. Um, then there were other things like I weren't allowed out for anything longer than two hours. Um, and before I signed the working agreement, I asked for clarification of my solicitor if she can just verify that you know he can't be banned from the birth and he'll still be there before I signed any of it. Now, when my solicitor runs the social worker solicitor, because obviously she can't speak to the solicitors, it's got to be solicitor to solicitor, um, they'd actually turn around to her and said, we'll be straight with you. If you're going to have him at the birth, if she's going to have him at the birth, then they're not going to go for a care order. They're just going to ask the judge for a removal order. And to be honest, we think they'll get it. Um, so again, my solicitor said, you know, listen, if you want to keep your child and you want to fight this, you, you need to just do as you say for now and we'll go from there. So I ended up giving birth on my own. Um, I hemorrhaged after I had her as well. So I literally had about 30 seconds skin to skin as soon as I had her. Um, then about 15, 16 doctors ran in the room. Baby was taken off me. I had no idea what was going on. Nobody there for me or anything. Um, then I had to have a discharge planning meeting at the hospital before I could even go anywhere. And then when I did get back to the placement that they put me in, um, or the day after I had her, literally about 12 hours after I had her, we went to the first court hearing. Um, obviously, I said I wanted to be present, and they said we're not allowed to take the baby from the hospital. So I ended up having to leave Demi in hospital, even though she was breastfeeding as well. So the hospital gave her a formula bottle, which messed her up with breastfeeding as well. It took me a week to wean her off formula, which was, it was crushing, not feeling like you were enough for your baby to, you know, it's something I'm supposed to be able to do. And again, that would never have happened if they didn't do this. Um, we went to court. The judge ordered an interim care order. And the local authority asked, if I could either be placed in a mother baby unit or a foster placement. 
and the judge had agreed and my solicitor said don't worry if they try and put you on a foster placement you, you've already said you don't want to go there they cannot move you until um if you say no they have to take it back to court and the judge has to agree because they haven't specified it has to be a foster placement um they then went ahead and moved me on new year's day knowing that i wouldn't be able to get a hold of my solicitor for any advice again they turned around and kept threatening me with adoption and said the judge has already said you have to do exactly what we say and you're clearly not doing everything that we say so we'll tell the judge you know that we want to go for adoption instead because you won't comply with anything we're telling you so again you know demi was seven days old the day that they moved me um i got pressured into doing it he was also telling me that all the advice my solicitor was giving wasn't true and that i shouldn't trust her um because she's purposely trying to make me lose and purposely trying to misinform me so that i do do something wrong um i think lawn we're getting was it an hour a week contact they give you it, an hour a week contact he didn't That's even three, three days and three months yeah in, in three months he had literally less than three days contact when you bunched all the time up um an hour a week contact he didn't even meet her until she was a week old um all the way through the assessments we had a family support worker who were doing the assessments and we genuinely didn't get on with her and the social workers knew this she knew this one of the last times we seen her we actually ended up in an argument well not an argument but a bit of a a bit of a bad debate um she ended up chucking in lawn's face when he said well how would you feel if you'd only had less than three days contact with your child in three months and what was her response she leant forward to me and said yeah well i ain't got a criminal history like yours i've got someone i've got a problem yeah she, she leant forward and turned around <coughs> and said yeah well i ain't got a criminal history like yours so i won't have that problem dead aggressively of her um we, we just had problems with them all we had the, one minute the social worker was saying yeah we're going to increase your contact and we're going to do this that and the other and then two weeks later she was going back and changing her mind through everything the guardian also said that um because lawn went to the criminal crown court against the allegations made against him because he knew he didn't do it i knew he didn't do it we just had to prove that even the victim yeah he, it got to the point where when he was actually in court the victim herself came in and when she actually seen him because she hadn't seen him previous to seeing him in court she said i've seen him before you know i've seen him with his girlfriend that definitely wasn't the guy who did this and um, the guardian had said to us before though once he's gone through criminal proceedings you know if he gets his not guilty verdict and he's proven it's not him that should change everything everything should stop didn't change a single thing and not a single thing stopped they even still tried to use the fact that the police had come round and because of the way that they came round and because it was a bit as they like to call it traumatic they still tried to say that was placing Demi at risk of significant harm they said that I um we'd what what was the word emotionally harmed her while she was in my belly because she was because it happened and obviously i was pregnant with her that that put her emotional harm um they lied saying that um i've had a social worker ever since i was little because of some of that happened to me they tried to say that i hid social services involvements from my midwife um they also said that i wasn't looking for a property and i ended up having to get my solicitor to get all my green notes from while i was pregnant which stated in there that I did tell them about previous social workers' involvement. Um, I had to get a letter from the council to prove that I had been shortlisted for properties and that I was looking for a home. Um, they also offer a family, what is it? A family, family nurse partnership. A, a family nurse partnership. And if you're under the age of 21 or 22, you get support at being a parent. Now, I declined that because I brought my brother and sister up, so, you know, I did the feeds, I fed them, I took them to school, I washed the clothes. I did everything that my mum should have done. So, in my head, if I were to accept the family and partnership, it's wasting time, money and resources from someone that actually needs their help, who doesn't have a clue what they're doing. They then try to say that 
um, in me doing that, I was putting Demi at risk of emotional and future harm because I didn't want support. Can you let me in my door, please? Can you let me in my door, please? Can you let me in my door, please? She grabbed my wrist and started yanking them! Jack, calm down. That is why I did that. You hit me, you will end up in handcuffs and you will end up in a van. You do not hit. Alright? Well, you won't are coming, say that to Mum! You Jack. are coming with us. No, I ain't. I'm sorry. James. It's not what we want at all, James. When did you get into it as well? Well, I came in through James. the door there to enforce a court James. order, okay? I don't care, it's up to me. No, James. it's not up to you. I don't know how old you are, but it's not up to you. Everything together for the children. Are they together? Well, just what they've got here. You ain't! Dad, don't pack my stuff! If you have not pack your stuff, you go without it, Dad. No, I'm staying with my dad, I don't care. Alright. Could you, rather than film me, no. no. He can film you. Let's do what you got. Come on, Jack. No. 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 Jack, I'm sorry. So, uh, what is the most critical thing to remember whilst dealing with social services? The most critical thing to remember and the most important thing that people need to remember is to record everything. Audio record, video record, document, names, Numbers, references, councils, everything. Remember, you are entitled to three forms of identification as well and record them. When you look at the families who get their children back or fight to get them out of the system, you'll see that it's because they have recorded everything. They have gone public with everything. So the council, the state, haven't been able to hide anything, haven't been able to, to keep everyone from seeing what's really going on. You need to record it. You are not on your own when you're going through this. And I know they are intimidating and they will tell you you're not allowed to. It is bollocks. And I'll tell you how it is. By law, you are lawfully allowed to record yourself and anyone around you in public. When dealing with professionals like social services and CAFCAS, you are allowed to record for your own record. It, the only information that's being shared 
is yours and your child's personal private information. They are there representing a company. They are not there representing themselves. Therefore, their information is not shared. Make sure you document everything. Make sure it is recorded. For example, if a professional tells you you're going to get your kids home and you've done everything you can and this, that and the other, and they won't look at removing your children. If you have not got that recorded, it's going to be your word against the professionals. And in court, they will say that you're lying and that's proof that you're lying because you can't prove it. Is this uh, something that you never did at all? I did record phone calls, but I didn't really go public with them. I did with a couple of uh, phone calls, but I didn't with all of them. I have still got them all recorded. I just didn't record all the meetings because I wasn't aware. One of the meetings I recorded was with uh, the manager of my son, who actually admitted in that meeting that she that there was no reason to take him and she was going to help me get him home because I didn't do anything with it. And I thought they were telling me the truth and I thought I'd wait and see. The recording meant nothing. So obviously now you've learned from that mistake and you want to feed that information off to the Yeah, public. I've also done my research and I've spoke to people and it's also online as well for people to see the people who have recorded it and have put everything into the public domain before it's too late, they have successfully got their kids back or got contact with their kids. Okay, so before we end this uh, interview, is there anything else you would like to add to people that might be thinking of having a child and might have social services on their back or, you know, people that do have social services on their back right now? The only thing the only thing that really is going to help people is by doing your research, learning your rights, knowing your rights and holding them to their job. They do not have any authority, which is why they call themselves the local authority. They rely on bluff and blackmail and threats. And it works. It works with all of us that we work with because we had nothing to hide and we'd do anything to bend over backwards for our children. OK, well, uh, nice talking to you and I, I wish you and your group, families destroyed by the state, all the best in the future. Thank you.